Okay, there we go. Okay, awesome. All right. Good deal. Good. Let's start this over again. <laughs> Sam, thanks so much for, for taking time out your schedule to be with us today. Um, just to kick things off, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into organizational culture? Well, it really started about 20 years ago when I was promoted to a VP level job and kind of had to get a, a large organization united behind some strategies and plans. That's when I was exposed to culture. So uh, it's been a long journey from doing it as a business leader and really trying to apply best practices to, to then doing it full time, probably on over 200 culture related transformations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you founded, um, is it Culture University? Yeah, I started cultureuniversity.com because, uh, you know, what I was seeing, for instance, on social media or most of what people write about culture is actually not consistent with the pioneers of the field. Yeah. And my personal experience as a top leader, I mean, it, it's not about the five keys to, to culture change or it's all about hiring. I mean, everything just seems very uh, off base from what many of the pioneers advocate. Yeah. 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 So um, culture is a very conceptual framework, if you will. European, how would you articulate the importance of culture, especially in a business context? Well, I mean, I, I just go back to where I started, but again, it was all about uniting the organization behind our most critical uh, performance priorities. I don't know culture is anything else. So yeah. when I hear people talk about culture as being soft, you know, it just makes me sad because they're, they're totally missing what culture really is and how it should support your results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tim, can you, can you walk us through kind of um, a mental model, if you will, how if you're if you're a business leader and you're accountable for a strategy or something as tactical as a, a technology implementation, how should they think about you know how should they consider culture within that context? Sure. So you know the realm of culture is all about values, norms, beliefs, and assumptions, right? It's all those unseen things. And in any organization, you know you've got a culture, and there's aspects of your culture that are gonna help you with that technology transformation or whatever the change is. And then there's aspects of the culture that may hold you back. Uh, Cause your culture is always reinforcing the current state status quo. Um, you know, we wanna get the culture to a point where we're more adaptive and it's easier to handle change, but it can be a very long road to get there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And in, from your experience, is, is culture something that is fixed or is it something that you have to manage throughout the business life, life cycle of your organization? Well, that's hopefully the shift we're going through is, you know, culture now is kind of managed at the fringes. It's either organizations going through crises uh, that are trying to deal with things uh, far greater than just culture, or yeah. it's the progressive organizations, you know, the Zappos, the Southwest Airlines, you know, um, but they don't have to worry about culture change as much, right? They're building on a very constructive culture already. So it's, of course, tremendously easier to manage change. And, you know, we're trying to go at the vast middle. Uh, those who maybe have tried some different things uh, that they think are culture related, but probably were more about the work climate, things, you know, related to engagement, involvement you know, great place to work efforts, all of those types of things. But, uh, you know, my favorite Shine, uh, Edgar Shine quote is that culture yep. builds shared learning and mutual experience. So that's where it connects to change. It's all about managing major improvements to drive learning and results. Um, that, that gets to the heart of culture. Yeah, yeah. And I know you work with a lot of organizations. Um, how are they considering leadership in, in their culture initiatives. In, in your mind, I, I know you have a bunch of stories you could probably tell us, but um, what's, what's the best approach? Because we know that you can't drive a successful culture initiative without um, thinking about leadership. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, a colleague has referred to uh, the approach that 
I know I advocate as almost a double helix approach, where on, on one angle, you're wanting to engage people in the change effort uh, more intentionally, more inclusively to drive learning and results. But all of that work will bog down at some point if the leadership side of things is not being managed intentionally. So we want to make sure we're developing leaders to know the how-to side of these change efforts. Um, of course, we want them to model the behaviors we're targeting, uh, but yeah. that's not good enough if they don't know how to engage people, whether it's 10 people, 100 people, or thousands of people. You know, you can model the behaviors and not know how to scale them in your organization. Well, we had several questions in the community around metrics. So in yeah. your experience of working with organizations, how how can an organization evaluate the culture? What what common are there common metrics, common KPIs associated with culture initiatives? Sure, absolutely. And we'll always want to differentiate. Are are we actually looking at culture metrics, right? We're we're measuring values, we're measuring norms. That's what the human synergistics instruments do. Uh, yeah. you know, and we have yeah. the most widely used and thoroughly researched true culture assessment. But most of what people are looking at when they think they're measuring culture is actually measuring climate. So all your engagement, great place to work assessments, yeah, all these yeah. you know, quick and dirty uh, pulse assessments, right? So those are usually measuring the work climate, these surface attitudes and perceptions about systems, structures. It might be outcomes like uh, motivation, satisfaction, teamwork. So. We, it's not that one is better than the other. The deal is we need to measure and get a common language around both culture and climate. Uh, both are critically important. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. So you could do a climate survey and find out we've got lots of communication problems. And that's going to hold us back on this technology transformation. But you would go about what you do very differently if you've got a culture where there's a fear of speaking up, right? And, and people aren't you know, comfortable sharing what's on their mind. So obviously on that technology transformation, you know, you're not gonna identify problems early enough. You're not gonna yeah. surface people's fears and concerns. But you'd go about that differently if the problem was a lot of internal competition and people mm -hmm. not sharing information across groups and you know, lots of win-lose, uh, you know, frameworks going on. Well, that's a very different approach we'll want to use with our communication. So we're emphasizing collaboration, some of the cross-group work and activities, you know, what are common goals across groups. So to really go at what we're going to adjust in our system structures processes, we want to be intentional about, well, what are we trying to build into this organization more behaviorally? So that's where this culture and climate is is not an additive game. It's not like one plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. It's just exponential when we start to understand both. Yeah, no, thank you for that explanation. Uh, and also, we know it takes time, right, to, to really build that future state culture that you're working towards. Uh, in your experience of working with organizations, are you seeing a specific time frame that it takes? I know it, it probably varies, but is it like a five-year journey? Is it a three-year journey? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a funny uh, thing I always refer to when this question comes up, and, uh, and that's Edgar Schein kind of talked about a formula related to what needs to be there in order to say there's been a culture change. So that helps you start to think about time. So first of all, there has to be a, a new or more consistent pattern of behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The results in some form that reinforce that that behavior is worth it. So this, hey, we're starting to share information and collaborate across groups and be more intentional and get people uh, included in decisions that impact them, right? Yeah. If it doesn't for a result, people won't continue that behavior. It's got to operate for a period of time, and yeah, that's usually going to be even years for it to really get into our culture. Um, but then the fourth is people have to like it more than their approaches. And they may not like it initially, but we'll look back and say, yeah, this is, this is better for us. Now, the key is the results precede the culture change, right? Because it's, it's got to reinforce the behavior 
before yeah. it could ever be a norm way down the line. And then we go back to, well, how long do you think you can initiate something new in your organization very intentionally and people stay on board before seeing results? And I've asked hundreds of people this question, and usually the answer is well less than a year. So I kind of steer people towards in six to nine months, you better be seeing movement with leading indicators or it's yeah. over, right? It's over because you don't have the reinforcement loop. Even if you've found ways to show the behavior and be more intentional and try some things, people will start to question the entire approach if we're not getting that reinforcement loop of some results for the organization. That's a, and that's a very valuable nugget. So if you're working on a culture initiative, aim to, to get some results within the first six to nine months. That's, that's, that's absolutely great. Well, what, what we're designing in the change is points in time where you're getting feedback and prioritization across large groups. So at the first point of engagement, you're, you're getting them connected to the change, their feedback matters, and you're adjusting the approach based on their feedback. Now, next month, next quarter, you might say, well, hey, we, we kicked this off a couple months ago. Hey, what's really working that we need to continue or build on? And hey, what's not living up to expectations? So you're, you're guaranteeing you're going to drive the learning. And the only question is if you've gone far enough with the, the changes and the improvements to, to really deliver the result. But you can design your change to drive learning because you're putting in cycles of feedback and prioritization to keep people connected. Yeah, yeah. Tim, from a structure perspective, who owns culture? Who owns culture? Because oftentimes you you will have the C-suite and they'll come up with the, the business strategy. And then you have your middle managers who are really trying to bring that strategy to life. Um, you know, some say it's, it's HR should lead it. Maybe it should be operations. Um, oftentimes, maybe a culture initiative is happening within a large technology implementation, something that's really affecting the whole entire enterprise. Um, it, it's a weird question, but who owns culture? Well, I, I think there's no individual owner. It's not a, uh, yes, it's this group or this individual, um, but I think there's three ways to think about it. There has to be a driver of the change effort that is really going to understand what culture is, how it evolves. You sure hope at some point the CEO or the top leader that says culture is important actually knows what they're talking about and has learned mm -hmm. enough for the light to go on about what this work really means. And then, of course, there's the broader organization where we're wanting to build own ownership so people feel connected to, to the changes and improvements. And if there's not a sense of ownership, uh, it'll die there also. So you as the change leader are the most critical because if you can't articulate and educate others and get senior leaders involved and know what they're getting involved in, it dies there. If you can't get changes going where a sense of ownership and inclusivity you know, is part of it, then it'll die on the vine also because you never can scale things. So we know those have to be part of our effort. It's just how do we design it in and know that we're going to get there at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With uh, within organizations, you're always seeing a turnover in leadership. How yeah. often, you know, in your experience in speaking with a number of organizations, how often should the organization pay attention to its culture? Because normally, you know, we talked about this before. Culture only becomes a problem when when you have to change. But how right. often should you should you pay attention to it? Well, I mean, it's really shifting as a field from something that's done when there's a problem to something that needs to be intentionally understood all the time. Gotcha. So what we advocate is the first time through is the hardest, right, to really understand our culture, climate, how it's driving our results, and trying to connect it to a major change effort. But through that effort, we're wanting to then sync up some habits, some structures to be looking at culture more intentionally, just like we would strategy. So we want to sync it up as an input to our strategy development, or else 
our culture will determine our strategy, right? If we're not yeah. really aware yeah. of how we're being driven as an organization and we're not talking about where things need to change intentionally and got a good language around that, you know, we'll just keep going down a path uh, from a strategy perspective that's driven by our current culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's your what's your thoughts on you know multinational organizations, global organizations, where you may have to maintain a localized culture, right, in in one country, and but you have to also maintain some maintain some type of unity as a, as a global organization. What are your, what are your thoughts around that? So it's it's no different than uh, an organization in in one geography, actually, because you'll have different subunits or teams. And the only way you're gonna keep those subunits and teams together is if they feel part of something bigger than themselves, right? Part of them, their individual unit, right? So whether it's countries or departments or whatever, we wanna build a common core. And often that's gonna be driven by being connected to some of our top strategic priorities. But then it's not gonna feel real to me in my department or my country unless we're customizing how you're engaging me and how I'm working on my problems and our goals, right? If, if we're not customizing the approach as it lays out across these departments or countries, then it'll die there also. So we're trying to find this balance of connecting people to the common core and our most critical strategic priorities, but the work on the ground is customized and adjusted using the yeah. same type of inclusive approaches you're using for the overall organization. Yeah, yeah. And, and Tim, you know, it's, it's 2019. Organizations are going through a lot of change. Mid-size to large organizations are going. They're just implementing between 100 to 250 projects a year, um, just adding so much technology. They're restructuring because there's a, uh, there may be a recession on the way. Um, a lot of organizations are restructuring. How, how do you think about, you know, managing culture in, in the future? Right, like, what's the what does the future of 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 the OD field look like when it comes to managing culture? How could we how could we improve? Well, I mean, it's it's stopping this view of culture being some other thing that we develop plans around and strategies around. I mean, the the future is really you know putting it alongside or with strategy, where it's really understanding our core what's been built up in us through history, what do we want to preserve, what do we need to evolve? The future is really seeing it looked at like, like strategy, but it almost being more powerful than strategy because mm -hmm. it's driving things on so many fronts of our organization. So the future is intentional culture management is the norm that yeah. you will be looked at as clueless if you're not understanding your culture and dealing with you yeah. what you find. Yeah, let me cover one quick thing before you give a question. So a lot of people will ask, yeah. well, what's the work actually look like, <laughs> right? Yeah. I get yeah. it's important, I get all you're saying, but what's the actual work look like? We follow a four-phase uh, structure on every project every engagement, and we do that with our consulting partners across the world. But uh, we look at in phase one, well, what's the why behind the change? You know, why, why are we even interested in culture in the first place? It's a technology transformation, it's yeah. customer experience, it's whatever it might be. And let's get clarity around the current state and, per and perceptions about how culture is playing a role. Then we build a baseline. We use qualitative and quantitative techniques, both are critical, looking at both culture and climate to again, with that performance priority, customer experience or whatever, how's our culture yeah. helping us and where exactly is it holding us back? And then we create change. We look at, well, for that priority, what are our current plans and strategies and how are we going to adjust those to drive learning and results based on what we've learned about our culture and climate? So how are we gonna adjust our customer experience strategy, our technology implementation? And then how are we going to design in learning and sustainment practices so we can carry this over time and make sure we're engaging and re-engaging groups, we're adjusting change effort based on that feedback, and then we're, of course, 
communicating results and stories and examples so that we can spread things beyond those individuals who are directly part of every action. So view it as like a cycle where we might start that on a technology transformation. You know, if it works, people will start to get that, yeah, these are the practices that really work with any major transformation or improvement or strategy or plan. And we want to build that in our operating models. So before our strategy meeting, you know, we're going to do the culture assessment. Before our company meeting, we're going to tie in feedback and prioritization on our number one strategic priority. So, you know, we're going from an individual change with kind of this four phase to really syncing it with our whole operating model. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear just fine. Okay, good. Um, thanks, Tim, for this discussion on culture. Um, it's something that I've been involved with for years on different projects. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and as a change manager, it's something that you have to constantly um, be thinking about. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it can't be separate. Um, it's got to be ingrained in all your planning and, and everything. Um, so uh, my question for you, you know, beyond just knowing how people are predisposed to maintaining the status quo, people will typically resist change. Um, what are your, what have you found are the biggest obstacles to changing a culture? Wow, where, where do I begin? I mean, it's, at the uh, at the end of the day, I I only think there's three things that stop it, that downright stop it, and one is top leaders not changing their own behavior, right? Because if if the organization sees leaders not walking the talk, it's kind of over. The second is leadership that's not open to a far more inclusive approach. So I mentioned these you know, efforts to get group feedback and prioritization efforts, company meetings, all staffs, whatever. You know, if we're not open to uh, more inclusive approaches and we want to send an email out is about the best we can do for a communication update, <laughs> um, I have problems. And then last is, you know, are we really committed to a very disciplined approach, right? When we do feedback and prioritization and say we're going to make some improvements in specific areas. Do we see it through, track it through to completion, mm -hmm. you know, give the feedback to the organization, get feedback on, hey, what worked, what didn't work with that? I mean, are we really committed to a disciplined approach? So those would be the three things that undermine most culture-related transformation, leader behavior, lack of a very inclusive approach, and lack of discipline on, on follow-up and execution. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It all makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks, Tim. Oh, you're welcome, and, and there's obviously more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure I'll have some more questions for you. I don't want to hog, the, hog your time, so. Uh. All right. All right, thanks, Jennifer. Sure. All right, so uh, Tim, next we have a question from Jeanette. Let's see, Jeanette, do you, can you unmute your mic? Yep. How's awesome. that? Awesome. Awesome. We, yeah. we can hear you. Go ahead. Good. Hi, Tim. Thanks, Brian. Hi, Jeanette. Hi. Uh, so I'm working with this international client, and uh, they're family-owned and have been really tough to move forward. Let's just say that. Small <laughs> town, small family, big company. So a, an effort that has been successful is restating, refining, and distributing, uh, articulating values. So an, a, a new simple and wonderful set of values has been articulated in a very inclusive way, including all these different countries. Leadership. Now, I think that that now needs to permeate the culture. And there's, mm -hmm. there's some resistance to structuring that process. There's this sense, well, we've articulated the values and people have learned about them. Now we just have to let it seep in. <laughs> and I'm reluctant, I'm reluctant to let it be completely, uh, I love organic approaches, but it, there's gotta be something that connects these values to a culture change. And, definitely a vision of what that change needs to be but 
is that enough information to give me advice or I'm a little uh, yeah that's I'm not that's sure plenty. how to lead them quite frankly well you can't convince people necessarily that culture change is needed unless they see the gap and can experience that in some way. So what, what's necessary is, okay, if these are our values, uh, how do you engage people around the reality of where we're living them now and where we're not? Because if it's in our culture, just defining values, uh, they don't seep in, right? It's deeply entrenched. So if we've defined the values on the right side of the river here, but the organization was built and has history back on the left side of the river, right? It, it just, we just can't forget the left side of the river and our old history. So where we want to understand is, so what are the behavioral norms, the unwritten rules that, that truly exist? And um, what I did recently was with one of the largest brands across Africa, was they were uh, refreshing their values. And we, as part of that process, we, did the qualitative, quantitative, understand the current state. And they learned so much from that, they changed their values to not only include the behaviors they encourage, but they made a statement around the behaviors they want to discourage or see less of. So for each value, they had the more of behaviors and the less of behaviors. And I really think that's the future of value definition is you know, we can beat our heads against the wall all day long about these wonderful values we put out there, but they just don't seep out into people's behavior. Again, culture's learned. People have learned what works and what drives results, and they'll only um, apply a new behavior if they learn how to do it in their, our organization to an achieve and a result. So we want to create that gap. And uh, if they see the gap to those values, then they might be interested more in understanding how's that holding us back? How's that undermining results? And do we want that to change or are we good with those results being held back? Mm -hmm. so, so hopefully you know, some of that helps. Yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. It's super helpful. It's, <laughs> it's so concentrated though. I need to slow it down and listen to it in slow motion. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, again, what everyone wants to, uh, um, cover the surface of this culture stuff. And the surface is like espouse values and things like that. Uh, but I, I, I love this quote um, that I heard that, you know, everyone wants to maintain and look at the, the surface, but uh, culture is more like the, the Platte River, you know, that uh, it's a mile wide, but people only want to look an inch deep. Okay, awesome. All right, so we have another question from, oh, thank you, Jeanette, for, for asking the question. We have another question from um, Jennifer, I believe. Jennifer, can you unmute your, your mic? Yep, can you all hear me now? Okay, yeah, we, we can hear you. I, I told you I was gonna have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, no problem. <laughs> well, I mean, this was a little bit in response to Jeanette's um, topic that she brought up and and you know you need to be able to articulate what your values are in order to mm -hmm. to change the current state culture to to your desired future state culture um, but something that I found and I wanted to share with this group that really worked um, was tying our rewards and recognition program to our desired future state values and so we we sat down and we um, we landed on six core values that we we wanted to focus on, um, and we felt like were really important in order to change the culture positively at the organization mm -hmm. that I'm currently at right now. And um, and then we we built a whole recognition program around it. And so not only are we articulating what our values are to drive culture change, we're also um, calling out examples of people who are living those values. So I thought that was a really powerful way to go beyond the words and, um, mm -hmm. you know, just put some action behind it. Um, and, you know, it, it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to do it. 
And so we're not only recognizing people, but they, they got rewarded uh, nicely with um, a cash prize and a big trophy and, wow. you know, recognition at a all hands town hall where they were getting standing ovations. I mean, we made a big deal about it. So um, I, I wanted to share that because I thought it might be helpful to the rest of the group. Um, you know, Absolutely. about what you can do. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Matt, thank you for that. That's helpful because going back to that shine formula I mentioned before, right? We we're talking about what behavior we show, they showed what results we achieved, right? Um, you're keeping the recognition program over a period of time. And of course people like it because they like these stories, examples, the recognition. So it, it helps with all of those um, areas, uh, but we never want to confuse, you know, changing one system or structure with the learning to really shift major behavioral norms because we want to understand if there's a fear of speaking up or if there's you know uh, that internal competition or command and control or perfectionism we want to understand why that's so deeply entrenched and if we're not dealing with those root causes so if our recognition program didn't deal with those root causes uh, then we can't expect that it will change the culture just because we did more positive systems and structures that will help but we, we may not have all the pieces of the formula yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely not the cure-all or, <laughs> and, you uh, know, it, it's not gonna, um, you know, be the one and done solution to, um, you know, changing a culture. It's, it's one, you know, one part of a larger puzzle. Yeah, we, uh, we use this uh, culture roadmap in some of our planning efforts and let, let's say it was a technology transformation or customer experience. What's the from to shift in the culture we're targeting? What's our vision for engaging people more inclusively and overcoming, you know, some of those culture challenges? What are some of the behaviors we're going to target in on? What are our strategies, goals, measures, management systems, communication systems, and recognition systems? Uh, because really we're trying to address all of those in connection to the change or the problem we're trying to solve. And, uh, you know, step 10 is those uh, motivation systems and you gave a great example. Yeah, I agree hundred awesome. percent. Yep. Jennifer, thank you for the, thank you for the question. Thank you for sharing that story as well. So Tim, um, we're, we're, we're now at the end of, of the webcast. I just want to thank you again for your time. Um, and all the knowledge you, you've provided over the last 30 minutes. And everyone on the call, thank you for taking time to join us as well. So um, this concludes the webcast, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.